Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's just now 10 o'clock. My name is Justin Gifford. I'm the Community Relations Officer for South Central Michigan Works. Uh, on behalf of the Agent Area Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and spending the day with us. Um, please do stop out and talk to our vendors out there. Uh, I'd like to take a brief moment and informally introduce Mach 1. Mach 1 is the South Central Michigan Works mobile one-stop computer lab. It's a uh, big RV that's sitting out in front of the entrance. You're free to utilize that this morning for any business purposes, check out email, copy, print, or just to get away from everything so you can uh, make some phone calls. It will be open during the vendor time, so if, we're, if there's a presentation going on, uh, Mach 1 will be closed. The computer lab itself consists of 12 network PCs and a satellite internet service. Also has the availability of uh, Wi-Fi internet uh, that you can connect to outside of the bus if you need to. At this time, I'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsors, Frontier Communications, Next Step, Gross Puggy, Gruel, and Roof, the Farber Foundation. The Farber Foundation actually uh, donated some funds to us that made it possible for us to invite 100 high school and college students into the venue today for uh, no charge. So we appreciate their donation. I've been given the privilege this morning to introduce Mr. Brandon Farber who is part of the Farber Foundation. Brandon is one of the two fourth generation farmers to work for Bluesfield Manufacturing Company. The company was founded in 1946 by Brandon's great grandfather. In his tenure at Bluesfield Manufacturing, Brandon has spent time working in all areas of the company, learning the company itself from the ground up. His years in live television production experience at Fox Sports, working with Detroit Tigers, Detroit Red Wings, and the Detroit Pistons have helped to make him a key player in the creation and management of Blissfield's digital, digital, digital media campaign and all marketing collaborative. Brandon is also a proud community supporter with an affinity for all things technology. So at this time, I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Brandon Farber to the stage. Thanks, Justin. Um, in manufacturing and most other industries, uh, technology is a driving force of competitive advantage. Uh, leveraging it appropriately, I feel, uh, is a major key to success on any level. At Blissfield Manufacturing, we understand the importance of forward thinking. Since 1946, we've been world leaders in refrigeration and heat transfer technology and have recently launched a cutting edge wastewater remediation machine called the Pro 2. This machine is capable of saving municipalities millions of dollars per year in hauling costs, yet is not limited to this specific application. On behalf of the Farver Foundation and Blissfield Manufacturing, Thank you to the Chamber for the opportunity to introduce the initial keynote speaker of this great event. It is vital to support the development of our younger generation as these individuals will, will serve as our future innovators and community leaders. It's the foundation that we lay today that enables the cultivation of brilliant ideas. We are honored to be afforded the opportunity to support this occasion along with many other commendable community endeavors. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's initial keynote speaker, Chad Wiebesek. Chad oversees social media for the state of Michigan's tourism office and manages Pure Michigan social media efforts across eight social media networks. Pure Michigan continues to be one of the top ranked tourism agencies for its effective use of social media and was recognized with a 2012 Mercury Award for the best use of social media. 
the Pure Michigan campaign launched in 2006 and quickly rose to the top. It was named by Forbes as one of the all-time best travel campaigns ever. Today, you will learn how Pure Michigan uses social media to accomplish specific objectives. You will leave with actionable insights that you can put to work as soon as you return to your offices. You will learn about the tips, tricks, and tools that can save you time, grow your followers, and supercharge your social media efforts. Chad, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for the, the great inter introduction. Uh, my name is Chad Wiebesick, and um, I oversee social media for, uh, for the state of Michigan and uh, for the state of Michigan's tourism office. I give a lot of presentations throughout the US. Uh, this last winter, I was speaking at a conference in El Paso, Texas. It was winter here. It was low 80s in Texas. It was beautiful. As I was leaving the conference, I was checking out of my hotel. The concierge said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And she said, where's home? I said, Michigan. And then she looked at me and she said, better you than me, she said. And she said that straight at my face. And I was slightly offended. I wasn't, you know, what do you think I'm thinking when she says that, right? What I think that she's thinking is that Michigan is a little bit like, like this video here. And we're going we're gonna to pull the reel up. Another dangerous game kids play is to tunnel in snowbanks near the road. A few years ago, one boy So one of the things that we're trying to do with the Pure Michigan campaign is to change the perception of, of Michigan being a winter wasteland to actually being a winter wonderland, right. And so we have our, our work cut out for us, but we're making a lot of significant uh, progress. One of the ways that we're communicating that message, besides the, the glorious TV commercials and the radio spots, is through social media. And so we're active on eight different social networks, from Facebook to Twitter to, to Instagram, and we've won a lot of awards throughout the years. And what we're going to learn today is just some of the best practices that have worked well for us that can work well for your business, if it's large or if it's small. At the end of the day, my best advice to any business is to align your social strategy with your business objective. That sounds simple, but at these conferences that I speak at across the US, one of the common questions I get asked is, does social media work? Does it work? That's like asking if a stick works, right? Because it, a stick is pretty good if you're propping open a door. Right? That, that works. It holds the door open. But a stick doesn't work so well if you're trying to do delicate eye surgery, right? So the analogy is you have to use the right tool for the job. Social media is good for customer service, for driving traffic and generating leads and stuff like that. And in fact, with our social media campaign, out of 3,000 sources of traffic to Michigan.org on any given month. By the way, Michigan.org for six years in a row is the nation's most visited state tourism website. It gets a ton of traffic. So out of 3,000 sources of traffic in any given month, Facebook is always in the top 10. So social media is a huge driver of traffic to our website, and it can be the same for your business as well. So we're promoting and marketing Michigan as a majestic, mythic, and magical place. And we communicate that message through, what do you see? Beautiful photographs, stunning photographs. And what's neat about this, and what I like about this example, is that these are photographs that I didn't take. I didn't pay someone to take these photographs. These are photos from fans. Fans are out there capturing photographs and sharing them with us, and then we're choosing the best photographs and sharing them. F 
Facebook is our most active social media community. Uh, we have 570,000 fans, and we're using a philosophy called visual storytelling, where we're sharing photographs. We're telling a story through, through photographs on our Facebook page. And routinely, we get comments like, your page is so beautiful, it belongs in National Geographic. One of the best tips for any business is to share photographs on your page. In my experience, uh, what we find is that posts with photos get 53% more likes, shares, and comments. So photographs are tailor-made for our business, right? Because we're, we're promoting travel and tourism. But even for an old-school, stodgy, industrial B2B manufacturing company, right, photographs can also work. So think of, think of clever ways to share photographs and bring your brand, brand to life through images. Here's an example. Who would have thought, I would have never thought, you know, five years ago that we would literally have hundreds of people out in the field every day taking photographs and just begging for the chance that Pure Michigan would sh will share their photograph. Five years ago, I didn't even think that would happen. But today we do, because we have travelers and tourists out there taking photographs on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and we're curating the best and sharing them like this. So 80% of the content that we share is from fans. 20% is from our own content. So we follow the 80-20 rule. We make fans the hero in, in, our, in our social media strategy. Here, here's an example. Not every photograph is really beautiful or stunning, right, or, you know, or, you know, marvelous. But this is a photograph that's marvelous in a different sense. Do you guys remember this? This is a, a photograph that somebody took that bears an uncanny resemblance of, of what? Michigan's Lower Peninsula. It's the shape of the clouds, right? And this photograph went viral. At the time, we had 400,000 fans and twice as many people, nearly a million folks, saw this photograph on Facebook. It got liked and shared and commented that, that, that many times. And in fact, this photograph was so popular that that following day, somebody came and photoshopped the Upper Peninsula <laughs> and shared that. I guess the UP was so heavenly that it had floated away in the original photograph. And so this picture also went viral. And then due to the popularity of that, we started seeing all sorts of different shapes and and objects in the world that look like the mitten, that looked like Michigan's upper and lower peninsula. So we curated a Facebook photo gallery, and we got some unusual things. You know, we got a T-bone steak that looks like Michigan. We got some foam, some beer up there. It looks like Michigan's lower peninsula. We got a, a fish stick over there. We had fun with it. M Live picked it up, and they said, the fish stick steak state Viral photo of mitten-shaped cloud inspires Pure Michigan Gallery. So, I was, tell, tell me if this has ever happened to you. This was December 6th at 11.49 a.m., any regular day. I'm at work and I get this tweet that comes through my feed. It says, I guess we should clarify. We think the only Awesome mitten is Michigan. Apparently, Wisconsin thinks it's a mitten, too. This was tweeted by the Awesome Mitten, which is a blogger in Michigan that promotes uh, good things happening in Michigan. It's just a, a regular tweet, but it had a link, so I clicked on the link, and I saw this photo. And it was a photo from Wisconsin's website, and they're using the mitten to market Wisconsin. Interesting. So after the awesome mitten tweeted that, at 2.45 p.m. or around there, there started getting a little bit of chatter from some of awesome mitten's followers. Some people were retweeting and leaving comments like, you might need a few more fingers to fill that Wisconsin mitten. We, and we all know they just have mitten envy, you know, and some kind of funny, you know, tongue-in-cheek comments like that. That was 2.45. 
At 7.17 p.m. that evening, a small newspaper out of Kalamazoo published a story called Wisconsin's Use of Mitten to Promote Winter Tourism a Real Stretch, Michigan Fans Say. So here we are. What, if anything, do we do? And if we do something, why do we do it? There was only one tweet. It generated 11 retweets and one small story in the Kalamazoo Gazette. What, what do we do? Likely, the sensible answer is, is do nothing, right? Because this is in the middle of December. We're busy promoting snowshoeing and skiing and and ice climbing and stuff like that, and we're, we're busy, and this kind of is a mild distraction. It's talking about some other stuff. That's the sensible thing to do is just do nothing. But we did something, and we did something bold. Not only did we do something big, we did it bold. This is what we did. We launched a website called whoistherealmittenstate.com. I get into the office the next morning after that 7 p.m. newspaper article. I get into the office the next morning at 8 a.m. I pull the team together, the brand manager, the web developer, the graphic designer, the VP of marketing. And we have an opportunity we have a window of opportunity to do something and to do something big and to drum up some excitement and try to milk the press and get even more chatter than just that one newspaper story. So what we did was we launched the website, who was the real .com. and We launched this website. We've never built a website as quick as we launched this. This was built within three hours. So the website had a few components. It had a poll. We were inviting Wisconsin and, and Michigan folks to, to vote who they think is the real mitten state. We had a live Twitter feed where, where we picked up hashtags of mitten gate or give us our mitten back. We had another hashtag, my why mitten battle. So we had a real time Twitter feed of that. And then we also used uh, a, a live uh, message forum where we invited people to leave comments. We wanted to create a virtual water cooler to bring people and, and create conversations on this website. What we found <laughs> was we got uh, an awesome outpouring of reaction. We got fan submitted photos like this where somebody's saying, if the hand don't fit, you must acquit, right? <laughs> we got other stuff like this. Draw a mitten shape was the class assignment and A plus for Michigan and this poor student over here, Wisconsin, see me after class, the teacher says. We even got some, you know, some funny stuff like this. Here, Wisconsin, you can have this. It looks like a, a coffee pot. By that day, before the close of business, just mere hours after launching this website, we got statewide news coverage on Michigan Public Radio. Uh, Wisconsin picked it up. Not only was the news coverage in Michigan, but in Wisconsin. We're gonna play this video here. So, who would have thought that a mitten could create a clash with our neighbors across the lake? But there's a war brewing in the blogosphere over who the mitten state is, and if there can really be two, David Douglas outside tonight on the patio to explain, David. And people are actually very upset about this. People down in Michigan, we'll get to that in a minute, but Wisconsin kind of looks like a mitten, doesn't it? I mean, here's Madison, here's Door County, here's Bayfield up at the top. State tourism officials certainly thought so, and include the image as a part of an evolving campaign showcasing travel here. Well, down in Michigan, sometimes known as the mitten state, people are angry. With a chill in the air, hands benefit from a little bit of cover. They're really, really fuzzy and warm. And for these UW sophomores, the cover of choice are mittens. The top comes off, so if I want to text when I'm walking. Wisconsin Tourism Secretary Stephanie Klett would be happy. You don't need a slogan to have effective marketing. After first representing the great state of Wisconsin as a leaf, a change of seasons brought about the mitten. But Michiganders have their yarn all tangled. 
You see, that state shares a mitten-like shape and has claimed it as a name. Not fair. There's only one mitten state, and that's Michigan. Klet says the Badger State isn't trying to take the moniker, just having a little fun with marketing. And the fun is just beginning. With a cheese head on it. And then we're going to have the little Door County thumb with the bratwurst in it. And then we're going to have it with the rose in it, because we're Rose Bowl bound. So look out, Michigan. Uh, forget the mitten. This is a mitten having fun, and fun is the top travel motivator. Not to mention, why can't there be two? See what I'm talking about, though? They can be friends side by side. It's a pair of mittens. <laughs> you know, great Midwest states come in pairs. A historic look shows Wisconsin represented as a hand-shaped state isn't new. Russ Feingold used it iconically in his first Senate campaign in 1992. Next stop, lacrosse. But just to put it all to rest, we asked our UW sophomores from Minnesota and Illinois to give us a hand. And you say, Wisconsin wins by far. I think Wisconsin wins. Again, an impartial arbiter. Yes. <laughs> all right, so... Wisconsin was getting into it as well. They fired back. We launched this website, and the next day, they fired back. 7.23 p.m., they posted this on their Facebook page. It is the colors of the Green Bay Packers, which was undefeated at that time, and uh, Detroit Lions had lost their last game. And so they rubbed it in our face, and they posted this on Facebook. Facebook, and they got a ton of chatter because of that. People are saying uh, more stuff, and Wisconsin fans are supporting this, and Michigan fans aren't. It's creating more chatter. There were comments like from Wisconsin fans, we don't want to be the Mitten State anyway. Talk about lame. Packers, Brewers, Badgers, Brats, and beer. Let's throw Michigan a bone on this one. Michigan, Wisconsin's were, were, the folks were kind of split. Some thought they were the Mitten State. Others, like these folks here, didn't. By 7:10, excuse me, by December 7th, 10:20 p.m., it made national news. CBS News says Michigan, Wisconsin, don't steal our mitten. I think the best headline. Out of all this, news frenzy was from Gawker, which says, dumbest war ever rubs over which state looks most like a mitten. I think that was the best headline ever. And so that next day, we asked our Facebook fans, we invited them to continue the conversation. We invited them, and we asked them, hey, let's have some fun today. We have a question for you. Which, why is Michigan the real mitten state? Let us know in the comments below. And they did. And, but we didn't stop there. We took out some advertising. If somebody, anyone in the U.S. did a search for Mitten, Wisconsin, or Mitten, Michigan, we bought some Google AdWords. And so we showed up in the first page of Google search results. Who is the real Mitten state? Brought you to Michigan.org. So we, we fired back to Wisconsin. It was kind of another lobby against them. And then we got some other more interesting user-generated content. You know, this mitten thing could really catch on, you know, and all these other states could be the mitten state. Hey, Wisconsin, how do you like it? Cheesehead. We got even more national news on USA Today travel. Michigan gives thumbs down to Wisconsin's mitten travel campaign is the headline for that. So throughout all this, there was a big spike in news stories, and then it started kind of leveling off. And what we wanted to do with this, because it was re a relatively slow tourism season, right? Summer's the most active. The, the winter months, there tends to be a lull. We, we saw an opportunity to generate more buzz, more news, which we did. So we saw a huge spike in statewide and national news coverage, but eventually it starts to trail down, right? And it starts to kind of die out. So we thought, let's try, to, let's try to do something again and get even more news coverage. So here's what we did. We did this. We teamed up with Wisconsin, and we shook hands, mittens. We shook hands, and we decided to do 
a charity drive, a mitten charity drive. And so we asked people in Wisconsin and Michigan to donate your mitten or glove or scarf right to your local charity. And uh, so we did this. We saw about, we got about 3,000 uh, mitten donations as a result. I think the best, one of the best comments was from the, the governor of Wisconsin. He says, our pure, Michigan, our pure Michigan friends have agreed to join us in taking all of this attention and turning it into something positive. We encourage everyone in both states to shake hands and donate mittens to make this winter a bit warmer. What I like about this quote is not only is it for a good cause, but do you see what he says? He says pure Michigan. So the governor of Wisconsin is using our brand. He doesn't refer to us as Michigan. He says pure Michigan. It reinforces the brand. So it drummed up even more chatter. Uh, people loved it. Love this PR move, people were saying. Spread the mint and love, other folks were saying. By December 14th, one week after that very first tweet by the awesome Mitten, it made international news. International Business Times says, the great Mitten State debate, Wisconsin versus Michigan. And as I mentioned, over 3,000 Mittens were donated. And so the result of all this, besides it driving a ton of traffic to Mich Michigan's website and driving a ton of traffic to Wisconsin's website, over, there were over 300 news stories that were published around the world, and it generated $17 million worth of PR buzz during that time. Out of uh, 150,000 web pages to Michigan.org, the, this website that we created was the second most visited uh, during the month of December. So how much did it cost to promote all this? We got $17 million worth, worth of buzz. It was zero, you know, other than staff time doing it. We did a little bit of you know, Google AdWords advertising. That was just a, a few hundred bucks or so. And that year it won the U.S. Travel Association Mercury Award. And that's George Zimmerman on the right uh, from Pure Michigan and on the left is Wisconsin. Wisconsin Tourism Director, and they're holding up their mitten hand. It was the first time ever that two states won and shared an award for this. And then I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, the Office Season 8, Episode 11, January 11th, uh, three weeks later. Uh, and the rolling credits, they were all sitting in a bar, and uh, the, they were playing a trivia game. The answer was Michigan, and they all got it right. Oh, and even Kevin down below. He got it right, too. He answered Mitten. So he was using Mitten as a synonym to Michigan. So I thought that was kind of uh, neat that it made that type of coverage as well. So here, here are the lessons learned for, for any business, large or small, travel or not travel, is using real-time content, real-time content marketing. And so when we, when we saw that tweet from the awesome Mitten, Right, it got a few retweets, a little bit of chatter in that one news story. That could have been it. And it would have been very quiet, and that would have been it. But we didn't let that be it. We did something, and we wanted to do something big. And we did something by creating that website, and that created more chatter. And behind the scenes, we called Wisconsin, and we were in constant conversation with them. And this was, a, this was more or less kind of an orchestrated fire fire media frenzy that was happening because we, we told them that we were going to do this and they nodded and they told us, let's, let's play ball. And so we cooperated with them in, in creating this real-time content. It took us three hours to create that website. There's an example of another company that did that recently, years later, uh, just this last year, and that was Oreo. Remember the Super Bowl this last year? The electricity went out for like a good half hour. And then Oreo sent a tweet and posted this on Facebook. Power out, no problem. 
Because everybody who was watching the Super Bowl, millions of people were all talking about, oh my gosh, the lights are out. And that was what everybody was talking about. And it took, within, it took Oriel 15 minutes, right, to send this tweet out. And it got thousands of retweets and thousands of new Twitter followers because they used real-time content marketing. Second lear lesson learned is to be social in social media, right? So at the time in December, we were very busy promoting winter activities, winter things to do, you know, um, ice climbing and snow snowmobiling, stuff like that. This little one little mitten tweet, that was kind of a distraction. But we noticed that there was a lot of conversation that was happening and things started to kind of bubble up, right? So we listened to our fans and we gave them more of what they wanted. Let's play out this whole mitten debate thing. Here's an example of what not to do. AT&T is not listening to fans. Within a 15 minute period of time, they tweeted the same thing to multiple fans within, and, and this goes on, this is the sna snapshot of a 15 minute period of time. They're heavily promoting their NCAA sponsorship. Don't do that, don't spam people, listen to people. The third thing that we learned as, as a best practice is that social media can humanize your brand. So the, the photographs that we typically share are lighthouses and sunsets and, and the lakes and, and golf courses, beautiful stuff like that. Sharing something about, about the mitten, right, that, it's a little bit, a little bit off-brand, right, but it's still on message because it taps into our sense of pride of living in Michigan, and it, it taps into, you know, we, 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 what we love, we love where we live, and it taps into to that sentiment. So it helped to humanize our brand. Social media can humanize our brand. Uh, an example of, of that is, do you remember this? Old Spice versus Taco Bell. Old Spice sent a tweet that said, why is it that fire sauce is not made with any real fire? Seems like false advertising. And Old Spice is always saying kind of witty, kind of snippy things. Taco Bell does not miss a beat. Taco Bell chimes in and says, Old Spice, is your deodorant really made with Old Spices? In a very kind of sarcastic way. And that could have been it, right? But then Old Spice fires back and says, Taco Bell, well, you know, it depends. Do you consider volcanoes, tanks, and freedom to be spices? And other brands started having fun with this, right? So Red Bull chimes in to Taco Bell and Old Spice talking to one another, and Red Bull chimes in and says, uh, hey, you guys, no bull. No, no bull. The original energy, energy drink is not made of wings, right? So brands having fun. This humanizes brands. And I don't know what body part this is, <laughs> but people stay loyal to brands they have an emotional connection with, so much so that they tattoo body parts with, with Pure Michigan. I think Harley Davidson is, a, is another company, right, another brand where people um, tattoo themselves. So I wanted to uh, leave a, a few minutes at least for, uh, for some q and I'm going to be here uh, at the conference uh, for a, a few more hours. I'd like to network uh, with you and, and, and meet you uh, in person if you don't have any questions for me at this moment. Are there uh, any questions? Let's take a, a few questions here. Yes, we have uh, one right here. Well, the question was, what was the biggest challenge of, of getting the campaign uh, launched uh, back in, in 2006? There was a lot of research that, that was done with focus groups trying to figure out what the perception currently is of, of Michigan and, and what people in the state and outside of the state think of Michigan. 
So focus groups were done. And what we found at that time in 2006 was people thought of Michigan uh, two different ways. One, one, one of the comments was, Michigan is like Alaska, only closer. Other people thought that Michigan was like Amish country, but with electricity. And in both those cases, you know, they're kind of backhanded compliments, but there's a little bit of grain of truth. You know, if you kind of look underneath the surface, there's a little bit of grain of truth. And, and I think what those focus groups were hinting at is that Michigan has a lot of abundant, authentic beauty, and there's a lot of wilderness, and, and there's a lot of natural, honest beauty around us, right? Uh, so that, uh, so that, that devised kind of the Pure Michigan brand, the, the Pure Michigan name, right? And Pure, Pure is broad enough that it can be kept relevant throughout the years, and it can be interpreted a, a number of different ways, right? Pure can be interpreted literally, pure, authentic, honest, right? But it also can be interpreted symbolically, uh, you know, as, as well. Yep. We've got a few more questions rolling in. Yes? Yeah. So that question is, what is the ROI of the ad campaign? So uh, the state of Michigan this last fiscal year invested $25 million in the campaign. Next year, next fiscal year, it's going to be $29 million, $4 million more. And that's going to be spent predominantly marketing in Michigan internationally over in Asia and in Europe. So what is the ROI of the ad campaign? This, this uh, sense... The, the last uh, three years or so, uh, the state of Michigan has commissioned a research company out of Canada called Longwoods International. So they're, they're out of Canada. So they, they have no vested interest in promoting one state or another or anything, right? They're, they're independent. And so they, they're a research company. And what they find based upon Longwoods International, International Research is that for every dollar the state invests in the ad campaign, this, this last year, the state got $5.70 in tax revenue from tourists in state and out of state coming and, and staying and, and playing and, and vacationing. It's, so a dollar in, $5.70 coming back. Businesses, the, the local Michigan businesses here, got a billion dollars from, from travelers and tourists. So we're fortunate that we have legislators that see the ROI of the ad campaign and continue to reinvest in the campaign. We're fortunate. Other states, Colorado maybe a decade or so ago, completely got their uh, tourism ad budget gutted and it just, it just devastated um, the, the tourism industry there, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that happens. But in, in our case for Michigan, we, we have um, legislators that, that, that see the value of the ad campaign. And I thought we had another question uh, right over here. Uh, without being online the entire time, how do you stay on top of the immediate things that occur or events that you might not be paying attention to? I mean, I know there's a lot of feeding that goes through, but how would you recommend? I mean, is there a staff person who follows that the whole time? So the question is, we are, everyone is so busy nowadays, right? how do we find the time to monitor and manage social media, right? If, if you were a big business or a small business, particularly for small businesses, where a small business, you're trying to be the jack of all trades. You're the office manager and the salesman, right? And even the CEO, right? And the dishwasher all at the same time, right? So how do you, how do you stay on top of social, social media and save time? There, in our case, uh, you'd be surprised at how few people we actually have managing our eight social networks. It's, it's me, and uh, we have uh, one other, two other people um, managing it. We, we use tools, we subscribe to tools like Radiant 6, right, which is a social media listen, listening dashboard that helps us uh, monitor for conversations that are, that are happening out there that we should pay attention to. For small businesses, you can use tools like Hootsuite, 
or TweetDeck that will pull in Facebook feeds and Twitter feeds into a centralized dashboard that allows you to schedule tweets in advance and Facebook posts in advance. And that's one of the sophisticated techniques that, that we use that any business can use to save time is to schedule your Twitter posts and your Facebook posts in advance. So we do this every month. So we have what's called a content calendar, and we plan out 30 days in advance on social media what we're going to say, where we're going to say it, and how we're going to say it on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and elsewhere. So we plan it out 30 days in advance. It's not sophisticated, really, because we're just using Excel. But for small businesses, if you map out 30 days in advance upcoming events or product launches or things you want to promote 30 days in advance, and you program that using one of these tools, then it's almost like set it and forget it for the most part. But you still have to be active and present, and you still have to create that real-time content and engagement. But it saves a ton of time for small businesses, a content calendar. Yes? So the question is, there's so many networks out there. There's a new one every month. How do we decide in our business, and or maybe even for your business, where to start and where to begin? We're on eight different social networks. That's a ton. But there's a ton more out there that we're not on. We're not on food spotting, for instance, and we're not on Vine. But actually, for the record, we claimed our presence on Vine so that, so that a cyber squad or somebody wouldn't claim our name, right? So, so, but we don't have an active presence there. In our case, where do we, where do we decide? Um, one, we listen. We listen to see if our audience is already there. And for your business, uh, think about, is, is your audience using that social network? Are they using Pinterest? Pinterest is great for wedding planners, for interior designers, right, for photographers. Pinterest is great for that. Google Plus is great for computer software, IT folks, and photographers, right? So it's great for that. So look at your business. Find where your audience is at. Which social networks are they using, right? Because you want to be where your audience is at. And then secondly, just look at your own resources and time. And you know, if you have the resources and you have, you have a staff member that is really into it, turn them loose, right? Um, because the last thing that you want to have happen is to start getting active on a social network and then have it fizzle off. Right, and, 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 and die because you only get one chance to make a first impression with a new fan and you want that first impression to be a good one. So be where your audience is at and make sure that you have resources and staff to manage it. Yes, we have another question here. Um, okay, so you have the 80-20 rule of earning the uh, and what you post. Out of the 20, uh, how much is boosted posts or advertising and like how Instagram now has advertising? What are your thoughts on faith? Yeah. So uh, if I can paraphrase that question, so uh, how much social advertising are we doing versus just kind of organic uh, posting? So uh, I'll, I'll share a story with you. We noticed, this is on Facebook, so last year uh, we did an analysis over a, a six-month period of time on, on Facebook looking at when we would share a post, how many fans would see the typical post? And we noticed you know, uh, over the six-month period of time that any time we would share a post you know, on, on average about you know, 100,000 fans or so, 120,000 fans would see the post. There was a remarkable drop-off back in October where it, that, the number of fans reached just plummeted, right? just bottomed out. And from that point forward, more or less, each time we shared a post, it wasn't 120,000 fans, it was 40% fewer fans. What happened? Facebook changed their algorithm. They changed what's called their edge rank algorithm. And edge rank, we haven't talked about yet, is a sophisticated algorithm Facebook uses that determines what content gets seen by your fans. Think about it, for those of us on Facebook. Think of 
family members or old college roommates that we're buddies of, that, that we're connected on Facebook, and we know for certain they, they're on Facebook and they post, but why do we never see their stories in our news feed? Why are there people that we're connected to on Facebook and they post, but we never see their stuff? It's because of Facebook's edge rank algorithm determines what you see and how much of it you see. And so they, Facebook, back in October, dialed down their edge rank algorithm. So brands, so posts from brands were, were shown to fewer fans. That next week, Facebook came out and made this big announcement. We're happy to say we have you know, some promoted posts, a new ad product called Promoted Posts, where Facebook is really happy if you want to reach 100% of your fans, right, or even 50% of your fans. Now it's pay to play. Now they charge you for the privilege of reaching more of your fans. So since then, what we've done is we've carved out about $25,000 over the year to do promoted posts, to do some of the testing of that type of stuff. And so we're judicious about which posts we promote and which ones we don't. Facebook wants $3,000, three, three grand. They want three grand from us to reach 100% of our 570,000 fans. It's going to be less for your business, right, because it's on a sliding scale, so the fewer fans you have, the less they charge you. So we're, we're starting to test social advertising. My best recommendation would be if you're going to do advertising on Facebook, fans aren't there to see advertising. They're there to connect with friends and family. So it's our responsibility as marketers to be responsible, right, and to have advertising that's clever or witty or fun or something that wants to get somebody to want to share it and see it. Let's not spam people. A question over here. When did you decide that Facebook and other social media was vital for us? Uh, so the question was, um, when did we notice that social media was important? With, with connecting with uh, Pure Michigan, with, with the community. Was that, that was the question? Uh, you know, frankly, uh, Pure Michigan was an early adopter of social media. And what, what we find in, in research is that, and, 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 and in our own practice, think of the, when was the last time, when was the last time that you went somewhere and you looked at a paper map? Right? You pulled out a map from your glove box to navigate somewhere. Right? When was the last time you did that? Years ago. What do you normally do? You go to MapQuest right? or Google Maps. You go online. When was the last time you called a travel agent? You know, I want to go, go on vacation. I'm going to call a travel agent. No. Where do you go? You go to Orbitz right? or Expedia. You go online. You know, people are, more and more travelers are going online for sources of information. So we were an early adopter in recognizing that people are shifting away from old ways of finding information to new ways of finding information, which is online. And so, like your business, we want to be where our audience is at. And our audience, more and more, are, are spending their time on, online. So um, we, we identified it pretty early. I have time for uh, maybe one more question, and I'll be around for the rest of the, the conference if there's um, no more questions at this time. All right, everyone, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Chad, for uh, coming in and sharing your knowledge. That's pretty awesome. Uh, just a reminder that uh, the exhibit floor is open until noon, and there's going to be three demonstrations taking place. Uh, Adrian Locksmith will conduct a uh, facial recognition demo at 11.15. Uh, we Photo will demonstrate the advantages of commercial photography at 11.30. And Right Signs uh, will demo effective, affordable signs at 11.45. So don't miss any of these, and thank you guys for attending this session.